everybody. Uh, so I want to continue with the uh, discussion of quantifiers. Technically, this is the next section, uh, section eight in chapter two, but um, it's a short section and it's really a continu continuation of the discussion from the previous section. So um, it just illuminates how quantifiers interact with implications, with if-then statements, and also talks about some linguistic conventions that are used in mathematics. A, a convention is something that we take for granted um, without, which is implicitly understood by people without being spelled out. Um, so let's see where this, uh, where this takes us. So uh, we want to talk about how implications and open sentences interact. So let's start by looking at an example. Um, so let's think about the statement, for all integers x, if x is divisible by 6, then x is even. So that's a true statement. I hope you believe that. If you have an integer which is divisible by 6, uh, so it's a multiple of 6, so it's a multiple of 2. So uh, it's not a particularly deep observation. Uh, but let's logically decode this and see if we can figure out what the pieces of this statement are. So if we take the statement apart, um, sort of starting on the inside, we have an if-then statement. If x is divisible by 6, then x is even. And if we ignore the quantifier for the moment, that's an open sentence because x is unspecified. So we can split this implication up into a p statement about x if x is divisible by 6 and a q statement about x, then x is even. And so we have two, I, I said statement, but strictly speaking, I should have said open sentence because there's this variable x. Uh, and if we ignore the quantifier, as I said, and we just think about the, the open sentence part, then p of x implies q of x is an open sentence. And its truth or falsehood depends on the truth or falsehood of p and q as x varies over the set of integers. Now, when you put a for all quantifier in front of an open sentence like this, for that to be true, what you're saying is that as this open sentence, p of x implies q of x, varies, plugging in different values of the integers, then no matter what integer you plug in, the resulting statement is true. It's, and as I think I mentioned in the discussion of quantifiers, it's a little bit like having a gigantic and. Here I've written that out where you plug in all the integers. So you take p of minus 5 implies q of minus 5 and p of minus 4 implies q of minus 4 and so on. So you get this gigantic infinite and. And that's going to be true only if every single statement that occurs in the list is true. So... In order to make sense of this, we need to think about when is an implication true? So remember what the truth table for an implication is. It's only false under, an implication is only false in the situation where the hypothesis, the P statement is true and the conclusion, the Q statement is false. Otherwise it's true. So this gigantic and, each of these implications um, is going to be true if either x is not divisible by 6. Remember, p is the statement x is divisible by 6. So for instance, this one here, which says if minus 5 is divisible by 6, then minus 5 is even. I mean, that's kind of a weird statement, but it's a true statement because as it happens, minus 5 is not divisible by 6. So this statement here says minus 5 divisible by 6 implies minus 5 even. And that's true for the silly reason that minus 5 is not divisible by 6. This one says minus 4 is divisible by 6 implies minus 4 is even. Now, as it happens, minus 4 is even, but that's not what's relevant. What's relevant here is, again, minus 4 is not divisible by 6. So the first statement 
is false, and therefore the implication is automatically true. So the only time anything, is going to in anything interesting is going to happen is when x is divisible by 6. So somewhere in this gigantic and, for example, is the statement p of 6 implies q of 6. And in that case, p of 6 is actually true, and there's something we have to check. Namely, is 6 even? Which it is. So in this gigantic and, there are kind of two situations. There's the situation where the number fails to satisfy the hypothesis. It's not divisible by 6, and that contributes a true to the for all. And then there's the x's, which are in fact divisible by 6. And for those, we better have q to be true. So putting this for all quantifier in here basically says, the all, even though it's a statement about all these implications, the only ones that are really interesting, the only ones where there's something actually about x, about q, are the ones where the hypothesis is true. And this statement's going to be false if somewhere in this infinitely long list of ands, one of the statements is false. And that can only happen if you can find an x which is divisible by 6, but is not even. And of course, you can't. So that statement is this, this uh, implication with a for all quantifier is true. So it's very common in mathematics to take this for all quantifier implicitly, even if it's not written down. And that's pretty much the entire point of this uh, section eight of chapter two. So you might read a sentence which says, if x is an integer divisible by six, then x is even. And there's no explicit for all x and z in there. But in fact, the way you should read this is for all x in z, if x is divisible by 6, then x is even. And what's happening here is we're taking advantage of the fact that for the integers not divisible by 6, we don't want to make any claim. And those are the all these statements in this gigantic and where the hypothesis was false. And so the implication was automatically true. And so this kind of focuses our attention on the x's where there's something actually happening, which are the x's where the p of x part of the implication is true, and you really need to know something about whether q of x is true. So here's a couple of other examples. You might see the statement, if f is a function from r to r and it's a differentiable function, then it is continuous. So what that's really saying in, in sort of formal logic terms is for all functions, f from r to r, if f is differentiable, then f is continuous. And it's really, it's really important, I think, to be able in your head to go back and forth between these two things, because this is formally correct. But in practice, the only functions, if you were asked, let's say, to prove this statement, you really only have to say, you, you, don't, you don't have to test every function f, you just have to check the differentiable ones. Because if you imagine this infinite sequence of ands, the ones where f is not differentiable are already true. So the ones you have to make sure are true are the ones where f is differentiable, and for those, you better make sure it's continuous. And, um, in the second statement, if x is a real number, then x squared equals x implies x equals 0 or x equals 1. This would be written for all x in R. x squared equals x implies x equals 0 or x equals 1. And again, strictly speaking, this is a statement about every x. But that's a little bit weird because, OK, what it's saying, remember, is that if you look at all the real numbers x's and you look at this implication, if x squared is not equal to x, this implication is automatically true, right? Because 
of the truth table for implications. If x squared is equal to x, then you better be sure that x is equal to 0 or x equals 1, or x is equal to 1. And of course, that is true as well. So um, this is really just sort of a heads up about language. 